Good evening and welcome to another brand new episode of I Med on Channel I. And today also the focus is on what has engulfed the entire world. It does not matter who you are, where you are from and what you do. COVID-19 has engulfed the entire world and it has affected every facet of society. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of precautions you take, you always have to conform to the health and safety guidelines. To talk about especially with a big focus on the vaccination process that has been started in Sri Lanka. With us once again, we have Dr. Sunil Ratnapriya, the Secretary of the Association of Private Hospitals and Nursing Homes in Sri Lanka. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you. Doctor, let's uh, get the discussion started on the vaccination process. Now that we've seen that uh, the government has started administering the vaccines to the public in Sri Lanka, what are the latest developments associated with the vaccination? How, how did this entire process of vaccination begin? Um, it is really, uh, uh, it is a program uh, basically organized by the government. So uh, they will announce from time to time uh, uh, that which sectors they are planning to vaccinate. So that is why they started with the state sector uh, hospital, the, the healthcare staff. And then they moved into uh, private sector healthcare staff. And even in the private healthcare sector, uh, I think in the government sector, uh, most of the categories were covered. But in the private sector, with the limited stocks, they gave priority to some sectors, some job categories, like medical, specialist medical officers, nurses, paramedical staff, the housekeeping staff, catering staff, like that, which they thought uh, would be uh, more at risk. And uh, so it is, uh, they only will from time to time uh, announce the category that they are planning to vac uh, vaccinate and the arrangement they are making. Right, doctor. So the public has this question in their mind, will I ever be eligible to get the vaccine when I can get the vaccine? So we see that, we, okay, they started with the government workers, the helpline workers, the frontline workers in different uh, facets of society, yeah. which is very important yeah. that we give the vaccine to them first yeah. because they are more at risk. So moving forward, when, when they open it up to the public, who will be treated first? On what basis would the vaccination happen? Yeah, I, I'm sure they have mentioned uh, things like that. Initially, it will be prioritized among the uh, citizens above 65. Uh, it, it has been mentioned, but it may not be so. But uh, no, even now, uh, now say uh, those who traders who attended the manning market, the vegetable uh, sector, uh, now they were vaccinated. Then the prison officials were prison jailer guards and such categories were vaccinated. Uh, so, uh, government will uh, plan, health ministry will plan and announce these sectors we will, uh, we plan to uh, prioritize. Right, doctor. And doctor, are there any guidelines as to who will not be eligible based on health reasons or age reasons? What are the parameters that are in play in getting to know the eligibility? Yeah. Uh, the government has, uh, health ministry has issued a detailed uh, circular giving instructions uh, and according to that there are, they have mentioned, uh, I have it with me here, uh, they have mentioned uh, those categories who may not be eligible for this. Uh, one is that uh, pregnant and those who are on lactation, uh, so um, the possibility of pregnancy has to be considered by everybody. Um, the, then uh, people about, uh, young people about below 18 has also not been recommended. So uh, because trials have not been conducted in such uh, categories. Then those who have immediate or delayed uh, severe anaphylactic reactions, severe reactions to vaccines those are also not being considered and then uh, allergic reactions to uh, components of the vaccine, severe anaphylactic reactions, such categories have not been uh, 
uh, recommended the vaccine. But those with comorbidities, they are quite okay. They are they can be they can receive the vaccines. Diabetes, hypertension, all that crowd. I think that's very valuable uh, information that you are passing on to our viewers, doctor, because it's important even if you are above the age of 18 and if you think you need to get vaccinated, you think that will protect you from COVID-19. It's important to note that if you have uh, severe allergic reactions, you better take care of yourself and you should inform the authorities. Inform the authorities. And then the authorities, I believe, doctor... They will, they will decide. They will take precautions and... Uh, consider. Yes, mm -hmm. like doctor said, they will assess and see whether you can receive the vaccine. And doctor, let's talk a bit about the vaccination process as well. If I'm yeah. not mistaken, there are two doses that you need to take. What is the time duration? How, how does it work, doctor? Uh, time duration also, initially, they were talking about 12 weeks. Uh, then, uh, uh, then there is, uh, again, a reconsideration because these are being... Uh, sort of re-discussed and re-evaluated. So uh, currently, second dose, they have not given a specific time period. But there is a second dose, but the time period is still not uh, firmly announced. Right, doctor, yeah. because these are uh, these are drugs that were introduced recently. Very recently. So, uh, so then the trials being, are yeah, going trials on. Are. Right, doctor. In talking about the vaccine, now there's a fear among the public to get this vaccine as well, thinking, and they've been hearing from the people who are vaccinated that it's it has a strong effect on your body, that you get aches, that you get fever. So when you talk to people, the public, they're scared to get this vaccination. So what are the after effects? So uh, yeah. what are the consequences that you go through when you're vaccinated? Yeah. Well, that's, those are not uh, things to be frightened of, but certainly you have to be prepared for such things because it, has, it depends on person to person also. Um, some, uh, these are the common things that they have mentioned, but, but you can get, you can get uh, on the site, you got the in, uh, injection, you can get pain, warmth, redness, itching, and so on and so forth then basically you can feel very tired, feeling very tired, fatigue-like, and then uh, feverish, mild fever, even chills. I have seen some people getting chills, joint pains, and uh, flu-like symptoms. So uh, many of them have uh, taken Panadol. They have, uh, while taking the vaccine, they have taken a Panadol, and then like six hours or eight hours, you can continue Panadol. Uh, some have developed kind of vomiting, so tablets, something like domperidone tablets you can take. So uh, you can reduce your symptoms, but at least two or three days you will have to rest at home. Right, but there is nothing serious. And no, nothing serious, yeah. I mean, no severe reactions. Uncommon, they have mentioned as uncommon being dizzy, you know, decreased appetite, pain, abdominal pain, and like, uh, enlargement of uh, lymph nodes and things like that, but not no re severe reactions have been mentioned. No severe complications have been mentioned, so they can be uh, they can go without much fear. Right, and as doctor said, it is nothing to be scared of. There's there shouldn't be any fear associated with getting uh, vaccine vaccinated because we see even in the society, you know, people are generally scared of getting of, uh, vaccinated. So that general they are fear is the yes, doctor yeah. injection. The whole idea of injection yeah. is something that induces fear in the mind of Sri Lankans, I think. Yeah. But that is like doctor said, and uh, you can take his testimony because he has gone through, I went through the it. vaccination. And as you can see, he's quite okay. I, like okay. he said, the, the symptoms or the conditions, the after effects of the vaccine can last for around <laughs> one day or two days, right doctor? About two days. About mm. two days. and But more importantly, that you need to get vaccinated in order to protect yourself from COVID-19. So that's uh, where you draw the line, where you decide this is something that you should definitely uh, get yourself uh, exposed to. And injection itself is not painful. It's just 0.5 ml. So it's much less than the, like a tetanus toxoid pain that you get in tetanus toxoid injection. So uh, injection itself is not painful at all. It is after that only you 
uh, see the effects. Right. Doctor, uh, as of this moment, the vaccination is only administered by the government in uh, government is, hospitals? It is uh, by the government hospitals, but uh, what was given to the private sector was administered by, uh, by the private hospitals themselves. At, when it is given to us, it was our staff who gave the vaccine. Right, doctor. So right now uh, we can see that it's been administered uh, at, uh, at private, private hospitals, hospitals as, as, well, well. as well. Right, yeah. doctor. Now when it comes to the private hospitals, doctor, we spoke about in the earlier episode how it's important that if you have the symptoms to go to a hospital, get your tested, get yourself tested. And also, apart from COVID-19, even when people have different kinds of other symptoms that can um, probably cause other diseases, people are still, we can see that they're still scared to go to these uh, institutions, to, the, to private hospitals, maybe may government hospitals, private. They're just scared of the fact of going into a hospital. How can we change this? What are the precautions? What are the specific measures taken by taken by the private uh, sector healthcare facilities? Yeah, uh, we have taken uh, several measures at the entrance as well as inside the hospital uh, and before the procedures. So uh, all those patients or visitors who come uh, are being screened at the entrance. There are uh, about probably in a big hospital two or three entrance points. So there are uh, security staff and the nursing staff to receive you and um, uh, the uh, hand washing facilities are there, the you know, foot bath uh, is also there. So you take your, wash your hands properly and then you come. Then um, your temperature will be checked to see whether it is less than 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees. Uh, then you should be wearing masks and things like that. Then um, you are given a screening uh, form, uh, hospital details form. So you need to fill that. Give your appropriate, uh, give your details, telephone number, address and so on. Uh, some of course consider this as a nuisance, but it is for the good, your own good as well as for the society because you may have to be contacted again. You may have to be traced back later, not at that time. And uh, then inside the hospital, uh, all staff, they are wearing the personal protective equipment, distance will be maintained and so on and so forth. Then um, if you are going through uh, surgery, uh, the uh, PCR testing will be done. Uh, and it, they will ensure that you are uh, you are not suffering from COVID. Similarly, the hospital staff, which are involved in surgery, including surgeons, uh, they go through regular PCR testing. Right, doctor. Uh, we talk about the development of technology and the technological advancement, especially in a post-COVID era. Let's talk about how the private sector healthcare has incorporated these technological advancements into treating patients given that you know that we have to avoid physical contact as much as possible yeah um, this is one uh, one area that we really embarked on from the time that uh, physical contact was discouraged uh, we went into digital platforms uh, consultations were organized online uh, telemedicine was used then uh, uh, the, the homebound care, the, the visiting, uh, visiting services for uh, di diagnostic tests, collection of blood and all those were strengthened so that uh, staff with precautions will visit the patient and discourage the patient from coming here. Then uh, for communication, online media were used very much. Uh, in conducting training programs, educational programs, uh, communications between hospitals, also uh, digital communications were used. So, uh, so that way technology was very useful and also uh, not in large scale but in a 
lower scale, something, uh, something uh, appropriate for our country. Lot of engineering measures were developed in order to reach patients uh, when the patients come for them to uh, sort of for them to be issued drugs and so on, other reports and things like that uh, to prepare uh, areas like that away from hospital, uh, things like that. So uh, that way also technology was used in a lower scale but very appropriately. Yes, doctor. And uh, before COVID, you know, we had to, after getting our tests done, we had to go back to the hospital to collect yeah. our reports. Now yeah. everything can be downloaded online as well. Correct, correct. So all these facilities are available to you through private healthcare as well as uh, government healthcare facilities. So there's no reason to fear or be afraid of going to uh, towards these healthcare facilities that are readily available for you. As doctor mentioned, they've taken all the necessary precautions to make sure that you and everyone around yourself is going to be very safe. And doctor, since we talk about the technological advancements, let's talk a bit about this contactless PCR testing system as well that's uh, available in few private healthcare uh, hospitals. Yes. Um, well, uh, the facilities are available for you to uh, come into the hospital uh, in your own vehicle and um, uh, get yourself tested uh, without walking into the facility. Uh, this is particularly for uh, uh, patients or persons who are who don't have symptoms uh, but wishes to get a test done, uh, probably for their occupation uh, purposes. You know, like pilots who are going mm. repeatedly, they have to undergo PCR then uh, they would also prefer not to get into the facility uh, and because they don't want to expose themselves and uh, again from the staff point of view also they also have less contact with the patient so uh, so this kind of facilities have been organized but we have to emphasize in such a situation that the patient has to be uh, con in contact with the hospital and uh, if you do it in the morning the test at least by afternoon you can get the uh, results and then according to the results we will be informing the uh, epidemiology unit of the Ministry of Health, the PHI and then uh, you have to be you have to be aware that you have to follow the uh, uh, ensure the follow up procedures after that. So doctor, I believe there's, uh, there's constant communication between the government uh, healthcare sector, the ministry and these private institutions as well. In, 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 uh, in a case where a positive case is reported, yeah. that communication is there and that's quite vital uh, as well. I believe. Yeah, the government uh, private sector communication is continuously there because um, one thing uh, there is organization called uh, private Health Services Regulatory Council, which is uh, chaired by uh, the Director General himself, uh, Dr. Alex Asilagunawadana. Uh, the secretary of that committee is also the Director of Private uh, Health. So, uh, of course, last uh, few months when the government was, the health ministry was very busy, we couldn't meet regularly. But uh, we are very happy that uh, this body is now again activated uh, and we have got a new director private health also and um, we had a meeting recently with the director health so uh, so even the vaccination program was coordinated jointly by the association of private hospitals and the private health services regulatory council so it was both our parties that collected all the details from the private hospitals throughout the country, then transmitted this information to the epidemiology unit uh, so that they could uh, plan the vaccine distribution program. So uh, while this permanent mechanism is there, uh, constantly uh, the patients who become uh, PCR positive are being informed by the private hospitals. We are duty bound to inform the epidemiology unit and the PHIs so that they can take the follow-up action. Doctor, we earlier spoke about 
the fear that people have of visiting the hospitals. I think as a consequence of that, we can see the footfall in private hospitals has reduced. This has greatly affected these private hospitals. So what is the association of private hospitals doing about that? What are the measures that the association has taken in order to uh, resolve this issue? Yeah, uh, in the beginning, we found uh, that a drastic drop in the uh, footfall. Uh, people were really scared to come to hospitals. It, I think it uh, dropped about 75% uh, initial drop. And this particularly affected the uh, medium and small hospitals, which are spread throughout the island in various cities. So, uh, but gradually we were able to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, keep them informed about the developments, uh, send them the new protocols issued by the Ministry of Health, uh, educate them and then gradually they got their act around, uh, started uh, uh, protectionary measures, uh, personal protective equipment and other training facilities uh, to uh, educate their staff and uh, gradually they were able to uh, pick up. And um, uh, last year during the period of July, we organized a, organized a major physical meeting where they were uh, took all the precautions and in a large uh, auditorium we organized a uh, seminar uh, for them to uh, send their representatives and then they were spoken to by experts in various fields including government organizations the economic problems mm. uh, the other administrative problems they have then the medical problems and so on uh, so we had a very successful seminar. So, uh, so this gave them a lot of strength for them to, uh, and also we facilitated for them the loan facilities and so on through the banks, and gradually for them the private sector industry to pick up. And uh, and uh, another important thing we that that we did was to. Uh, because initially, though uh, we, our hospitals have done, have been pioneers in the PCR technology, uh, initially the government, uh, we were not allowed to do the PCR for dengue uh, testing, uh, sorry, the um, COVID tests. We were doing for dengue and all, we were the most popular uh, centers for dengue PCR. So uh, gradually we managed to uh, convince the health ministry, negotiate with them, lobby with them, and we managed to, the, it was the association that managed to get the PCR testing facilities for some of the private sector laboratories. So I think that strengthened the uh, private sector. And uh, then again, another step that we took was to uh, convince the government that we could uh, provide care for the patients so that there will be less burden on the government uh, because the, those who can afford and our customers who have been coming to us will be able to uh, spend money and then uh, be in a facility where they can be looked after even at least at intermediate level. And then lastly, we managed to uh, get the vaccine for the private sector That's staff. Uh, with that, we've come to the conclusion of today's episode of IMED. We would like to once again thank Dr. Sunil Ratnapriya for enlightening everyone on the vaccination process, the eligibility criteria for vaccination, and most importantly, how important it is to get yourself vaccinated. And even if you're vaccinated, why it's so important to conform to the health ministry guidelines that have been set by the government and why this is a battle that we all need to fight together. The private healthcare sector is there, the public healthcare sector is there, but no matter what e efforts and measures that they have put in place, it's up to us as responsible citizens to stick to these guidelines and make sure that everyone around us stays safe and happy. So with that, thank you very much, Doctor, once again for joining with us. So that's all we have for you in terms of IMED for tonight. Good night and stay safe.